Your Excellency, the Prime Minister of Bhutan, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I, on behalf of the Royal Institute of Governance and Strategic Studies, would like to extend a warm welcome to the 15th Riggs Friday Forum Lecture. It is indeed an honor to introduce Sadhguru Jagi Vasudev to you all. Yogi, mystic, and visionary, Sadhguru is an author, poet, and spiritual master with a difference. Ranked amongst the 50 most influential people in India, he has spoken at many prestigious forums from World Economic Forum to United Nations to the leading business schools and universities of the world. Sadhguru is also the founder of Isha Foundation, an international non-profit volunteer run organization with over 7 million volunteers across the world. Isha Foundation is running large-scale grassroots projects in ecology, health, and education such as Isha Vidya, which is a very large-scale rural education project supporting close to 500 government schools. Project Green Hands is the largest ecological project in Asia, having enabled the planting of more than 27 million saplings with the support of over 2 million people. As a renowned speaker as an, uh, and as an author, what connects him to his audience is that he does not side with any religious sentiment and is involved with individual transformation. Marking a clear departure from mere customs and rituals, Sadhguru's scientific methods for self-transformation are both powerful and direct. He incorporates and presents what is most valid for the contemporary life from the yogic sciences and enables all those who encounter him to explore and experience the deepest dimensions of life. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today Sadhguru will speak on the Buddha within. And before I welcome Sadhguru on stage, we would like to present a short video to know more about Sadhguru and his novel initiatives. In the next half hour, you're going to meet a man who has a devoted following across India and indeed around the world. While yoga and meditation are at the core of his teachings to promote individual growth, the work of the foundation covers conservation, education and health. And you'll find him astonishingly pragmatic on a range of very modern day problems. Let's meet Sadhguru. 
for the very first time in the history of humanity. We have the necessary resource, we have the necessary capability, we have the necessary technology to address every human problem on the planet. Even twenty-five years ago, we couldn't have dreamt of it. But the only thing that is missing is consciousness. Today, the Spotlight is on a project called Green Hands in India. We started a mass campaign and uh, six years I spent planting trees in people's heads. That's the most difficult terrain, believe me. And now in the last six years, we've been transplanting it and that's happening much more easily. Action for Rural Rejuvenation is mainly aimed at rejuvenating the human spirit. English and computer skills are very essential to make these children come out of the hopeless economic and social pit they are in. If you could first tell our viewers what is the idea behind it, initiative, insight, which is more specific towards entrepreneurs. Whatever the nature of your business, ultimately it is all about human well-being. Isha Foundation, a non-religious, non-profit public service organization headquartered in southern India. We've engineered the outside world in so many ways, but we've done nothing about this one. If you want to know well-being, in is the only way out. This is what I want to teach you too. That is, you can be completely intoxicated without any drug, just on life. This is a shift from wine to divine. How can you love one and hate the other when the same divine exists in all? The spiritual process is not about looking up or looking down, it is about turning inward. See, the only thing that I'm really good at is just this. I can just make the air around me just crackle with energy. If you have to describe yourself in one word, would you consider uh, wildlife as two words or one word? It's… I would now like to invite Sadhguru on the stage. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev.
audio clear? Hello? Can't hear that. Needs to be raised. <laughs> okay. It's better. Good evening everyone. Namaskar. After this uh, two and a half millennia, <coughs> after this nearly no, <laughs> please give me a handheld microphone if necessary. I don't want to stand, just give it to me. Hello, is this better? After uh, over two and a half millennia, if we are to the word Buddha, Today, most people think of Gautama, the Buddha. Well, Gautama was not the only Buddha. There were many before him, many at that time, many more after him. Buddha is not his name. His name is Gautama Siddhartha. He became a Buddha. What does becoming a Buddha mean? The word Bhu means Buddhi or the intellect. Dha means Dada, one who is above. One who is above his intellect is a Buddha. One who is trapped in his intellect, he is a non-stop suffering human being. If something happens, they will suffer. If something does not happen, they will suffer. Because that is the nature of the intellect. Today, if you largely look at lives on the planet, at the age of five, how joyful you were and today whatever your age, how joyful you have become today. Has it gone up or gone down? Is a question. Has it gone up or gone down? Hello? Has it gone up or gone down? Gone down. At the age of five, when your intellect was so small, 
if you could be so joyful, if your intellect had grown in the right direction, by the time you are thirty, you should have been ecstatic, isn't it? But just the reverse has happened for most people. Not necessarily that they are miserable all the time, no. But they are not bursting with joy anymore. When you were five years of age, somebody had to make you miserable. Today, somebody has to make you happy. The equation has gotten reversed. Not because there is something wrong with life. Simply because there is an intellect for which there is no stable enough base. So once you are into the process of intellect, whichever way life falls, it makes you suffer for that. You, if people are poor, they suffer their poverty. If they become rich, they suffer their taxes. If they are uneducated, they suffer that. Put them to school, endless suffering. If they are not married, they suffer that. Get them married. I did not say anything. No children, they suffer that. Give them children, daily suffering. So, it is not a particular thing that people are suffering. People are capable of suffering anything. Yes or no? Anything they will suffer. Because the suffering is not in the life around us, the suffering is in the nature of our own intellect, how it functions. So it doesn't matter. You can be anything in the world and still suffer. So, being a Buddha becomes of tremendous importance <laughs> so that you are above the intellect. If you are above the intellect, that is the end of suffering because there are only two kinds of suffering in human life, physical suffering, mental suffering. Do you know any other kind of suffering? Are you on talking terms with me or no? Hello? Is there any other kind of suffering? No. Physical suffering, mental suffering. Physical suffering, it is not really suffering, it is just pain. Suppose an injury happens, something, a disease happens, there is pain in the body. Pain is not a very bad thing. Pain is good because if there was no pain at all in this body, most people would not know how to even preserve their body. For example, see, wherever there is no pain in your body, see in how many ways you have cut all these things. Simply because there is no pain, isn't it? Suppose there was no pain in your nose. In the name of fashion, You would have cut it up in so many ways. If there was no pain at all in the body, in the name of fashion, people would have pulled out their intestines and… Don't think I'm joking, people would do it. Pain is keeping them intact. You're walking on the street, if a bicycle comes, you step back. Uh, not necessarily out of humility, it is a consequence of pain, isn't it? If there was no pain at all in this body, if a truck came, you will go like this. <laughs> Even now some people are going like that. <laughs> so pain is very important right now. Till people come to a certain level of sense, pain is important. Without pain, you could not keep the integrity of this body. But transforming pain into suffering means the pain that happens in your body, you take it into your mind, multiply it a thousand times, that's suffering. <laughs> when was the last time when somebody poked you with a dagger? Hello? When was the last time? They never did. 
maybe when you were in school somebody poked you with a pin at the most or maybe they even that they did not do they just ignored you i am saying how much of your suffering is coming from outside that's the minuscule isn't it rest is all self help the sharper the intellect the more you can poke yourself people come to me and say sadguru i can't bear it my mother in law she's she's not even human and my husband well it's her son what else can he be my wife she's impossible my boss he's a slave driver all kinds of things i tell them don't worry your husband wife mother in law boss i will make sure nobody comes here you come stay with me we'll give you good food nice place to stay nothing to do just be joyful that's all just be joyful you don't have to work for your food and shelter i'll take care of everything for you only thing is i will make random checks on you whenever i check on you you must be joyful if you're not joyful i don't believe in feeding misery you know if you're miserable you should the misery should not be fed isn't it because it will grow you leave them alone in a room for 24 hours oh in how many ways they'll twist themselves if you're alone and you're miserable obviously you're in bad company isn't it yes if you're alone and you're miserable obviously you're in bad company if you're with me and you're miserable maybe it's me but if you're alone and you're miserable you are in bad company isn't it so becoming a buddha means you transcended this trouble spot of intellect only if you transcend can you use it the way you want otherwise it will use you in so many ways it is amazing people live for 50 60 years and still they don't know how to deal with their own thought their own emotion you may call it by many names anxiety misery tension stress no essentially you don't know how to deal with your own thought and your own emotion isn't it yes if you knew if you could have the thought that you want if you could have the emotion that you want right now would you be blissful or miserable blissful for sure isn't it so essentially the basic faculties that you have not taking instructions from you that is the main problem your body doesn't take instructions from you your mind doesn't take instructions from you and you hope to go somewhere suppose you sat in your car and your car became like this you want to go this way it goes this way is it safe to sit in this car i am asking your automobile you may use for a few hours a day it is through the vehicle of this body and this mind that you travel your entire life is this taking instructions from you that's the question so a buddha means someone who is the master of his mind what he says is what his mind does now this one cannot be miserable isn't it if your mind taking total instructions from you you would make sure every moment of your life you're blissed out not miserable for sure so being a buddha does not mean that you have to become something on the outside it is an inner process that you have raised above the body above the mind your experience of life has transcended the limitations of body and mind why is this important is can i ask you what did you have for lunch hello anybody can tell me what did you have for lunch what rice say something more interesting huh oh 
chili chili you ate something whatever you ate <laughs> whatever you ate in a few hours is transforming itself into a human being isn't it or in other words you were not born like this you were born this much today you became this much how just the food that you've eaten maybe half of it is chili i don't know <laughs> but it's just the food that we've eaten that is sitting here right now isn't it this body it is a piece of this planet yes or no say either you get it from me now which will be very good for you or one day you will get it from the maggots that day when we are buried you will even anyway understand this is a piece of the planet but if you understand right now we can live sensibly if you get it that day it's a nice but it's too late this is just a piece of the planet isn't it what you gather you can claim is mine but if you think it is me then you lost it it's like this here there's a vessel suddenly i take this in my hand and say this is my vessel you will think oh sadguru has got some problem but let's listen because everybody says he is wise after some time i said this is me then you will say let's go because if i claim something which is not me as me you clearly understand this is a question of insanity and sanity isn't it yes or no this you are doing every day in your life food appears on your plate you say this is my food you eat it then you say this is me is it true that you slowly gathered this body hello hello is it true that you slowly gathered this body what you gather can be yours but can never ever be you is it so whatever we gather we can claim it's ours for now but it can never ever be us isn't it so the content of the body was gathered from outside the content of your mind also gathered from outside isn't it depending upon what you exposed to accordingly the content of your mind so what you call as my body you gathered it is a heap of impressions this is a heap of food between these two heaps where are you if you sit on top of this heaps of body and mind we call you a buddha if you are lost in the heap what to do if you get trapped below the heap if you are below the mind then at least in india we call them buddhu <laughs> what do you call them here what do you call them here okay so the choice is this either you can be a buddhu or you can be a non stop suffering human being lost in the heap or you can sit on top of it and be a buddha now in some way you want to become a leader being a leader does not mean you have to rule a country or you have to do something it is just this let us say you are meeting 10 people in your life in in your day in a day let's say you're meeting 10 people when 10 people come your way you have a choice either to impact them positively or negatively or let them pass by if you impact them positively you're a leader if you if you let them pass by you are a dry leaf which will go whichever way the wind blows if you impact them negatively you are a criminal yes or no this is the choice every one of us have every moment of our life it doesn't matter 
whether we hold positions or we don't hold positions, every moment whoever comes in, comes in front of us, either we can impact them positively or negatively or let it pass by. It doesn't matter, you are at home and you have just two children, now you can still be a leader because raising future, ge future generation of this planet, creating the right kind of future generation for this planet needs a lot of leadership, isn't it? How small a role you have, how large a role you have depends on where the society wants to put you for a variety of reasons. Based on competence, situations, many, many things are involved. But you either being a leader or not being a leader is something within. First of all, are you an accident or are you a leader? <laughs> because if you're very experienced of life, whether you're joyful or miserable is decided by somebody else, you're an accident, isn't it? At least you must be a leader to this extent. What happens here, I decide. What happens within, I decide. At least this much leadership you must have, isn't it? If you have absolute leadership on this, then we call you a Buddha. A Buddha is someone who is able to decide what happens here. He doesn't allow somebody else to decide what happens here. There's a beautiful story. Gautama the Buddha one day was walking. A few people in a particular village stopped him and they abused him. They abused him in every possible way a man can be abused. Gautama heard all the abuses in full attention, not ignoring them, hearing every word of abuse. When they went on, then he said, See, what is this rigs? I have to go to these rigs people and I have something there. After I finish later in the evening, I'll come back the same way. If you have something more to say, you can tell me then. These are the kind of people, they will say ten things. If you say one thing, they will beat you. They said hundred things. He says, I will come back for more. What do you do with this man? Now this man is like this, not because he is a coward. If he claps his hand, thousand people will come. He can form an army if he wanted. Yes? He can easily form an army if he wants. He is like this because he's decided that he will live peacefully and blissfully. You pull him whichever way you want, he won't come your way. He will go only the way he wants to go. An intelligent man, isn't he? Hello? He will go where he wants to go. You pull him whichever way, he will not come your way. This is an intelligent man. This man will fulfill the purpose of his life effortlessly. But right now, most people are made like this. If somebody pulls this way, you will go away this way. If somebody pulls that way, they'll go that way. So once this happens, you will try to avoid people. Once this happens, you will try to avoid all responsibilities in the society because you're afraid somebody will pull you off the track. If you make yourself in such a way, Nobody can determine what happens within you. Then you are a Buddha. You determine what happens within you. This means all your faculties are in your hands. Your faculties are not at the mercy of what happens around you. How does one become like this? Let me explore a few fundamentals. I'm sure you must know more stories about Buddha than me, but let me try my hand at you. This happened one day, Gautama the Buddha was sitting in a large, large congregation of disciples. Early morning, sun is yet to come up, a man came. This man is a, a great devotee, a devotee of Rama, full-time devotee. See, many of you are smart. Your devotion is only part-time. Most people in the world are like this. They are keeping their gods like insurance. If something goes wrong, I also paid my premium. 
but there are few people who took this seriously and made it full time this is one of them these devotees won't utter any other word except god's name so if they want to call you ram ram if they want you to go ram ram if they want something ram ram no other word but ram he uttered he not just went to the temples he built many temples age is passing getting old just a little doubt because there are a few people who don't believe in god and they seem to be doing fine for them also sun rises in the morning for them also flowers blossom for them also food tastes good for them also everything is happening and they are saying there is no god suppose there is no god my entire life will go waste this question will come up to you only if you become full time devotee if you are a smart devotee who only brings in god when things go wrong otherwise you do your own thing <laughs> then this question will not come up but because he is full time this question came up suppose there is no god my entire life will go waste so he came early morning before sun arises came and stood there in the corner in the dark corner in the shadows because having a devotee for all your life now to ask this question is there god or no god is a very difficult thing he came there and asked the inevitable question is there god gautama looked at the man and gave a clear emphatic answer no all these disciples one big relief woof because any number of times they have asked this questions to him whenever they ask such questions he becomes silent he doesn't say a thing for the first time he gave a clear answer no god the message spread the entire town started celebrating because it has been bothering everybody is there god or no god god or no god every day it bothers them and this man won't give an answer for the first time he said no god the message went the enlightened one has declared there is no god see just look at the freedom of this no god means nobody watching you nobody keeping accounts of your karma and trying to torture you later on you can do what you want with your life so celebrations happen through the day in the evening again the congregation gathered gautama was sitting another man came this man is a charvaka charvaka means in india even today they are there charvakas are out and out materialists they don't believe anything other than what they can see even today in india as messengers of god go from town to town village to village trying to spread their message there are messengers of no god going from village to village and proving to people how there is no god this is the only culture which allows this anywhere else they would be killed but in this culture we allow them so th this is an expert charvaka it doesn't matter how what kind of a believer you are if you talk to him for 10 minutes he will prove to you no god thousands of people he proved no god no god no god but age is going getting old little doubt suppose there is god when i go there will he leave me and these believers also say he has got all kinds of torture equipment up there you know so he knows there is no god just a little doubt so he wants to confirm now there is an enlightened being here he wants to confirm so he came late in the evening after the sun has set stood in the shadows and asked this question is there god 
Gautama looked at the man and said, yes. Morning he said, no God. Everybody was relieved and happy. Now he says, there is God. What is the game he is playing? The game is just this. You believe something, you disbelieve something. It need not have anything to do with reality, isn't it? If we work hard enough on you right from your childhood, we can make you believe just about anything. Yes or no? Hello? If we work, on, work hard enough on you right from your childhood, we can make you believe anything. Just travel around the world and see what are all the different kinds of weird things that people believe. Unbelievable. All kinds of things people believe. This happened. I was speaking to a group of people in Nashville, in Tennessee, in the United States. I was just telling them a joke. In the joke, I referred to God as Him. Immediately a few ladies stood up and they said, Do you believe God is a man? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I know what I've gotten into. I was only telling you a joke. I said, it doesn't matter. You said him. Do you believe God is a man? Now in United States, particularly in the southern states, there is a big debate. Is God a man or a woman? They are trying to settle this in this election. So, uh, this went on. You heard of the Uganda man, Idi Amin? You heard of Idi Amin? Idi Amin declared, God is black. I agree with him. If a white man can have a white God, why can't a black man have a black God? Isn't it? But you know, these people do not know because God never went to that part of the world. God sent his messengers, his son and other people. So they've never seen, so they're just doing guesswork. In India we know God is brown. Because in India God himself landed nine times. You know this? You know this? You don't know? You missed it, huh? God himself landed nine times. Nine avatars, you heard? Ah, nine times God himself came. Indians are very proud about this. Especially Indians who live outside India, they are very proud about this. So I keep reminding them, that is because God wouldn't trust Indians with anybody else. <laughs> he wants to do the job hands-on with Indians. So he came nine times and he failed. <laughs> nine or ten times we can debate, we can't de debate failure, isn't it? So nine times he himself came and he failed. Oh, we can go on with this. What I'm saying is, what we believe is of cultural relevance to us, not of existential relevance. Existentially, what is there is there, what is not there is not there. So Gautama is doing this to move you from belief to seeking. Belief means you assume something that you do not know, isn't it? Yes or no? Okay, let me test you like this. Shall we do a simple experiment? Is it okay? How many of you believe you have two hands? All such people just raise one hand, please. What's the matter with the rest? <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you believe you have two hands? Or do you know you have two hands? You know. If somebody argues with you, and proves to you, you have no two hands. 
if their argument becomes too overwhelming, one slap in the face and he will know you got hands. Yes or no? <laughs> so with hands you know, with God you believe. Why? So, the problem is just this, we have still not become sincere enough to admit what we do not know as we do not know. This is the big problem with us. Is it all right? What I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. Is it okay? Whatever I do not know, I believe. How do you arrive at these beliefs? <laughs> How do you arrive at these beliefs? It happens in so many ways. Essentially, you take an assumption, you make an assumption and gather twenty-five people around you and say, this is it, this is it, this is it. If that number goes to twenty-five thousand, you made it in the world. This happened. A boy, an eight-year-old boy in New York City came back from school in the afternoon. He had a very progressive mother. Uh, being so progressive, obviously she was single. And uh, he came back home one day and asked a question to his mother, Mama, is God man or a woman? She's a very progressive woman, so she thought about all the gender politics attached to this and after much thought she said both. So the boy went into deep thought. After thinking for a while, he came back and asked, Mama, is God black or white? Again, she thought about all the racial politics in the country that is going on. After much thought, she said both. So he went into very deep thought. Then he came back and asked, Mama, is God straight or gay? She thought about all the politics related to that issue and she said both. Then the boy jumped in joy, I got it, I got it, it's Michael Jackson. <laughs> so everybody can make their own deductions and believe it. I am asking you, is it all right? Is it all right? What I do not know, I say I do not know. Is it all right? So human of you, so wonderful of you to see this is what I know, this is what I do not know, isn't it? If you see I do not know, the longing to know, the seeking to know and the possibility of knowing becomes a reality. Whatever you do not know, if you just believe, you will just believe, you can believe whatever. It gives you confidence. Belief gives you confidence without clarity. Confidence without clarity is the greatest human disaster that's happened. What is needed is clarity. Gautama, the Buddha, spent his entire life talking about clarity, methods to bring clarity into people's lives. But now we believe in him. No, he did not ask belief, he asked for seeking. Yes? In pursuit of truth, in produce, pursuit of the ultimate nature of who we are, not in assumptions, because it is said, I believe. No, I want to know genuinely, experientially I want to know. And what I do not know, I am willing to admit I do not know, not assume. If you concretize your assumptions, it becomes a belief system. So being a Buddha means being about the mechanisms of your mind. If you are about the mechanisms of your mind, which operates from gathered information, then you have a different vision, you have a different intelligence, that is you do not operate from existing data in your head. Right now your mind is operating only from the existing data, isn't it? You gathered something, from that it's working. In this nothing new can happen. Being a Buddha means you are above the data. 
you are above the data means you are seeing life just the way it is not the way it's happened to you till now if you see everything the way it is you can conduct life sensibly yes or no especially if you want to be a leader it's very very important you see life just the way it is not the way you think it is because in your own life you've seen when you were 10 years of age you thought this is it when you became 15 you looked back and thought oh my god that was so stupid that is not it now i know this is it when you became 18 you turn back and see oh at 15 i was so stupid that's not it now i know it for sure like this it is going on isn't it i want you to look at this one of the most important aspects of life the fundamental fact of life is we are mortal in nature yes you know the story for sure about what inspired gautama to drop what he was doing or his kingdom and his wife and his child and go in the pursuit of truth is he saw the mortal nature of the human being he saw a dead body he saw a sick person an old person which are all showing us that we are mortal we have an expiry date yes hello no we have an expiry date he was living comfortably when he realized one day there is going to be an expiry date then he thought what is the point of all this let me find out what is the nature of life from this it all started and this is the most fundamental thing all of us should be conscious that we have an expiry date if you are conscious that you are mortal you will have no time to do anything stupid in your life yes you will not do anything that does not matter to you you will do only those things which truly matter to you in your life if you are conscious you have a limited amount of time isn't it in the life of this planet you and me are just a pop up two second pop up you seen on your computer screen advertisements pop up and disappear because they paid only for two seconds <laughs> you are just a pop up on this planet you pop up and you pop out whether you like it or you don't like it this is how it is isn't it so so if you understand you are a very brief amount of time you will do only what truly matters to you isn't it if every one of us is doing only what truly truly matters to all of us this is a fantastic world to live in right now too many people are doing things that doesn't mean a damn thing even to themselves yes or no world is a mess simply because too many people are doing too many things which doesn't mean anything to them if we are doing only what really matters we would be different kind of people altogether this will come to you only if you remind yourself every moment of your life that this is a limited amount of time now as i came up on stage since then you are 40 minutes closer to your grave yes you are i'll teach you some yoga we can extend it a little bit we can postpone it but we can't avoid it yes we can postpone it i'll bless you with a long life you can postpone it but you cannot avoid it if you are truly exploring the potential the immensity of what it means to be human if you live for 100 years it will seem to be very brief life if you are living a miserable life it will feel like a long life have you noticed this on a particular day you're very happy one day passed off like a moment another day you're miserable one day feels like 10000 years yes or no so only miserable people have a long life <laughs> if you're a joyful person it's a very brief life before you know what's happening it'll be gone <laughs> yes it is so 
what shall I bless you with? Long life or a intense, blissful life, who cares how long? Yes? A very intense, blissful, fulfilling life. Who cares how long because the quality of life is not determined by how long, isn't it? But if you realize the immensity of being human, even if we are given thousand years, it's too brief. It's not enough. For what intelligence and awareness that a human being has hidden within themselves, if we explore this, a thousand years will be too little a time. But you are not given thousand years anyway. Even a hundred years, if you live, you will see, you feel like you just started at the end. That's how it will feel. Only if you are living a futile, useless life, it feels like it's too long and when will it end? No, you may not be thinking, others are. <laughs> People around you will be. <laughs> the problem is just this. Right now, not just what's happening in the world, even what's happening within you is not in your hands. That's why all this mess, this happened. A lady went to sleep. In her sleep, she had a dream. In her dream, she saw a hunk of a man standing there and staring at her. And he started coming closer and closer and closer. He came so close, she could even feel his breath. And she trembled, not in fear. Then she asked, what will you do to me? The man said, well lady, it's your dream. What's happening in your head is your dream, isn't it? Now the problem is not that life is not happening the way you want it, even your dream is not happening the way you want it. If your dream happened the way you want it, at least you could sit here blissful, isn't it? If your thought and emotion happened the way you want it, sitting here joyfully wouldn't be a problem, isn't it? Creating something in the world is another job. This is the problem of a leader. He wants to create something. Now you have to get the cooperation of a million people to do what you want them to do or what you think is the right thing to do. This will need more skills but at least staying joyful within you is most important. Not because joy is a goal by itself, because there is substantial scientific and medical evidence today to show that only when you are in a pleasant state of experience, you are able to use your body and your brain to its fullest. This you know by experience, but today there is scientific evidence. Is it true? Only when you are really joyful and peaceful, your brain and your body functions at its best. When you are stressed, anxious, fearful, this does not function well. This is a known fact. But today they have put it all in scientific data that this is what happens within you. There is evidence to show that if you manage twenty-four hours, most human beings cannot say this for themselves, if you spend twenty-four hours without a moment of anxiety, agitation, anger, irritation, nothing, just blissfully twenty-four hours, the sharpness of your intellect can go up one hundred percent in twenty-four hours time. Why don't you try, try it in the next twenty-four hours? It's time to try it, isn't it? But for most human beings, twenty-four hours have not gone the way they want. See, if one day did not happen the way you want, it's understandable. Not even one day happened the way you want. Now there is something fundamentally wrong, isn't it? Somewhere, we have not understood the fundamentals of how to do this. Do you agree with me? This human mechanism is the most sophisticated and complicated machine on the planet. Do you agree with me? I am asking you, have you read the user's manual? No? So you are operating it by accident. 
when you operate something accidentally, anxiety is natural, isn't it? Yes or no? If you do something accidentally, being anxious is a natural consequence of that. Only when you know how to operate something, you can joyfully operate that, not otherwise. So, this entire process, I don't know how, what it's become today, but this entire moment of yoga, of the Buddha's way of doing things, all this started wanting to handle this one consciously, not trying to fix the heaven, trying to fix this one, yes? So that we can conduct this the way we want. If we conduct this the way we want, we would be joyful by our own nature. And if I meet you, if I meet you when you're very happy, I'm sure you're a wonderful person. Hmm? But if I meet you when you're unhappy, frustrated, miserable, you could be a nasty person. Yes or no? This is true with everyone, isn't it? See, 20% 20 per, 20 of our time, resource and energy are spent in the prisons in South India and a little bit in the United States. People keep asking me, Sadhguru, we rarely get to see you, but you are spending so much time with these criminals. I don't see any criminals. Yes, if you look at their history sheets, what they have done, they have done terrible things. Probably if you let them out tomorrow, maybe fifty percent of them will do the same things once again. Yes, because I know them very well. <laughs> They become very friendly with me and they say everything to me. <laughs> I know many of them will do the same things. But when they are with me, I keep them very happy. And when they are happy, they are wonderful. Now keeping them happy is the problem. <laughs> because the man whom you call a criminal also wants the same things that you want, isn't it? Yes or no? He also wants the same thing. He also is in pursuit of his happiness. Only thing is, he is pursuing it far more vigorously than you. In pursuit of your happiness, you are willing to stand in a line. He cannot stand in the line. <laughs> he is far more vigorous in pursuit of happiness. So this is what I am saying. The moment you are in pursuit of your happiness, you are anyway a criminal. Yes, because this life is not about pursuing happiness. This life is about expressing your happiness in the world because happiness never rained upon you from anywhere. Whether joy happened or misery happened, whether peace happened or turmoil happened, whether pain happened, pleasure happened, agony happened, ecstasy happened, it only happened within you, isn't it? Hello? Do you see me at least? Hello? Even if you're not listening to me. Do you see me? Please everybody. If you see me, use one hand and point out where I am. Point out please, where am I? Oh, you got it wrong. You know I am a mystic from South India. Now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina. Where do you see me right now? Within yourself? Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself? Where did you see the entire world? Within yourself? Did anything ever happen outside of you, to you? Everything that ever happened only happened within you, isn't it? You saw the earth and the sky only within you, isn't it? The way it is projected within you, you have not seen anything else. Right now someone next to you, if they touched your hand like this, you think you are experiencing their hand. No, you are only experiencing the sensations in your hand. You cannot experience their hand. Yes or no? You cannot experience their hand. You are only experiencing the sensations in your hand. Now, even without the assistance of their hand, if your imagination is good enough, you can create the sensations in your hand without the help of the other hand. 
I'm sure you're doing it. So your entire experience of life is happening within you. At least what happens from within you must happen the way you want it, isn't it? The world will not happen your way and I'm glad. Because if the entire world happened your way, where do I go? The world is like this little bit your way, little bit my way, little bit somebody else's way, it's all right. But this one must happen my way, isn't it? Yes? And nobody in your life, not your husband, not your wife, not your parents, not your children, not your friends, nobody will happen hundred percent the way you want them. Yes? Or are still you such a hopeless romantic, you're still waiting that somebody will come who will be hundred percent the way you want them. You must listen to me and believe me on this one thing. See, I have lived long enough. I am telling you, nobody will happen hundred percent your way. However promising they may look in the beginning, <laughs> they will not happen hundred percent your way. Fifty-one percent your way means you are winning. <laughs> More than that you expect, it's not going to work, okay? But it doesn't matter, nobody happens your way. But this one person must happen your way, isn't it? If this person happened your way, I'm hundred percent sure you will keep this person joyful, blissful, wonderful in the highest possible level of pleasantness that you can. Yes or no? If you're living in the highest possible level of blissfulness, you will not think of going to heaven, isn't it? Yes? <laughs> those who have made a hell out of themselves, they all want to go to heaven. <laughs> People come to me, you know we are a volunteer organization, millions of volunteers, every day somebody is coming up to me and saying, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, this is so horrible, she can't do this, he can't do that. And I tell them, see, in this world, this is how people are like this, like this, like this, like this, this is how they are. If you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven today. <laughs> you know what's a qualification, go to heaven? See, this is one thing that's happening in the world. Human intellect is firing like never before more human beings are able to think for themselves than ever before in the history of humanity. Do you agree with me? For a long time, people could not think for themselves. They thought through their leader, they thought through their guru, they thought through their scripture, they thought through their something else. Today, people are beginning to think for themselves. Once people start thinking for themselves, he doesn't like thinking for themselves. <laughs> Once people start thinking for themselves, they will ask logical questions. When they ask questions like this, heavens will collapse. For example, you okay? Can I joke with you? <clears throat> In Hindu heaven, the food is very good. <laughs> if you like good food, you must go to Hindu heaven. Yes, because here Nala, he's the best chef in the universe, not in the world, in the universe. He himself will cook for you. So if you are a foodie, you must go to Hindu heaven. If you go to another heaven, you will see those white gowned ladies will float around in the clouds. If you like that kind of ambience, you can go there. Or if you go to another heaven, you will encounter virgin problems. If you like that, you can go there. But what is the qualification to go to heaven? This happened in a Sunday school in Alabama. Uh, a very enthusiastic uh, Sunday school teacher where the children had gathered in the church and he was going full, full steam. 
he asked what do you have to do to go to heaven little mary stood up and said if i scrub the church floor every sunday i will go to heaven he said absolutely another little girl stood up and said if i share 50% of my pocket money with my less privileged friend i will go to heaven correct another boy said if i help all those people who are in need i will go to heaven absolutely little tommy in the last bench stood up and said you got to die fast <laughs> that is the basic qualification you got to die fast when you die we will either bury your body or burn your body or feed it to the birds depending on the culture in which you are one thing is clear you put your body back into the earth because this is a loan that you took from the planet isn't it if you don't want to put it back you are a willful defaulter <laughs> you take a loan and you don't want to pay back this is not good you must be ready to pay back when the term is over joyfully isn't it so one thing is clear you leave your body here once you don't have a body what do you do with good food and virgins and all this stuff hello when you don't have a body where will you put the food so if you ask three questions all heavens will collapse if you don't make it collapse your children the next generation will shoot the heavens down with their simple logic you have any doubt about this your children will kill it it's better you do it <laughs> but if you don't do it the next generation will do it so when the heavens collapse heavens may collapse but human longing to experience something more will not go human beings will always long to experience something more whoever you are right now you want to be something more isn't it if that something more happens you want something more and how much ever more happens you want something more because there is something within you which wants to expand which wants to touch another dimension all the time so when once the heavens collapse but the longing for something more is there you will see i estimate in the next 60 to 70 years time 90% of humanity will be seeking chemical solutions already the percentage is going up dramatically in the last 25 years the number of people consuming prescription medicines alcohol and drugs to keep themselves reasonably peaceful or happy has increased phenomenally isn't it i was in london just a few weeks ago it's a prominent group of people i asked them what do you think is a percentage in london that people at least they have to drink a glass of wine otherwise they can't sleep peacefully other people are doing stronger things i i'm using a glass of wine as the minimum level they saying 99% other countries other cities are not far behind everybody is going that way now i am not looking at this as a moral issue but if 90% of human population is on chemicals to for creating peaceful experiences joyful experiences within themselves one thing that will happen is we will become incapable of making the next generation better than us this is a fundamental responsibility that we have that when we leave this world the generation that we leave behind is at least one step better than who we are isn't it if we don't do this we have failed in our fundamental responsibility so whatever yoga whatever buddha thought all these things are just about that that it's about conscious evolution of the human being when you were a monkey i'm sorry i didn't say this <laughs> charles darwin you know when you were a monkey you did not aspire to become human nature just pushed you on but once you become a human if you want to evolve you must consciously evolve if you don't consciously evolve you will stagnate and wonder why you exist this is natural for human intelligence if you are not evolving on a daily basis 
you will always wonder what is the purpose of my existence and people will come up with false purposes i am going to heaven i am going to eat good food i am going to meet virgins i am going to meet this all stupid stuff will come up good food nonsense everything is for this world to do it here isn't it yes or no this need not be raised to heaven these are simple requirements that even an animal wants to eat good food even an animal wants to copulate and reproduce this is not a big thing this can only be a part of your life this can never be the whole of your life isn't it yes or no all the survival aspects of our life in a human being are like this see if you came here as some other creature apart from being human stomach full life settled but once you come as a human being stomach empty only one problem stomach full 100 problems yes or no because what you call as human doesn't end with survival for all other creatures if their survival is taken care of their life is finished but for a human being life begins only after survival is taken care of when survival is in question it looks like a big thing once it's taken care of doesn't mean anything isn't it because the dimension that we refer to as human becomes alive in you only after survival is taken care of if you're fighting for survival right now you are just like any other biological creature isn't it there is no difference but survival is taken care of now we look at life now there are so many other possibilities so the purpose of organizing a society is to see that survival happens reasonably easy but now the modern societies have set themselves into this it doesn't matter what you give them they are still in the survival mode yes there still it doesn't matter we have more things than any generation ever had is that so in terms of material comfort we are the most comfortable generation ever on this planet do you agree with me but in spite of that we are the loudest whining generation we are whining and complaining like never before so it doesn't matter what comes we have gotten into this mode of being in survival mode all the time that is not the purpose of organizing survival the purpose of organizing survival is so that human beings can aspire for something larger something bigger another dimension of existence i am glad at least in this country some orientation towards this is kept the rest of the world is going crazy about raising the bar of survival to such a place it's impossible you know two meals a day was survival somebody says that's not it at least you must have a car now car is not it you must have a mercedes now mercedes is not it you must have a bentley it's going on endlessly the living earth statistics which has an authority on this kind of material subst- uh, subjects is saying that if we have to provide materially to all the citizens of the world over 7 billion people what an average american citizen has we need four and a half planets but we have only half a planet left what i'm saying is our survival has been raised to a place where it's impossible the only way you can run this kind of life is to keep half the population in slavery that's the only way you can run it yes if each person must have more than they can use the only way to do it is we must keep the rest of the world in slavery if we aspire well being for everybody we have to aspire in a sensible way our idea of success our idea of comfort our idea of well being has to be restructured but this can be done only if people are joyful you can talk to them because joyful people are flexible people frustrated people miserable people are not flexible people they are rigid you can't say a thing to them so the first and foremost responsibility is this that you are a pleasant piece of life 
if you sit here, you are a pleasant piece of life. You are peaceful and joyful by your own nature. If you are given a choice, either to work with joyful people, to work and live with joyful people or miserable people, what is your choice? Joyful people. You want joyful people around you. I want you to please, please, please remember, everybody else is expecting the same thing. Everybody else want the same thing? Can you offer this, offer this to everybody around you, I am asking? You may not be a genius, it doesn't matter. Can you at least be a joyful human being, a pleasant human being? Yes? At least this much you must do for yourself and people around you. Other things are subject to many things. Whether you will become the richest man in the world or not, whether you will climb Mount Everest or not, whether you will run faster than Mr. Bolt or not, whether you will become the 